This is another piece in our easy strength installment. We're doing easy progressions that can give reliable, predictable strength gains no matter what your experience is. Even if you don't wanna run a program, these are simple tricks you can apply to your main movements and your accessory movements that will guarantee as time goes on, you have direction to your training and you're not just spinning your wheels. So we've covered a few different types of progressions. This is one you probably haven't heard of before, though you may have heard of some of the systems that fit under this umbrella. We're gonna be talking about static programs or passive progression. Now, if you haven't heard that, it's because I just made it up. This is how I think about this category of training. And I'm gonna talk about the ways it differs from some of the types of training you might be more familiar with. With passive progressions, we're contrasting what normal progressions are, which are active. Active progressions move forward. You are using the mechanics of the program, deliberately turning those dials up to get a predictable result. So the idea is as you push those dials further and further, the result is the body is forced to adapt. So you actively progress forward, then you get stronger. Passive programs are going to do the opposite. They're going to expose you to a stress and it's over a few different timelines. There's a few different ways to do it, but the stress of the workload is only going to go up if you've gotten stronger. So it just flips this dynamic on its head. You get stronger, then you're justified in using uh, higher weights or doing more reps. And that is ultimately what causes the long-term growth. That's the pattern of progression. So this is a pretty simple dynamic, right? You get strength, allows you to increase the weight, the increase in the weight, that creates a stimulus that allows you to gain strength. So this is the dynamic between these two different types. So not to beat a dead horse, we've covered linear progression so many times. These graphs are just examples of, of many common active progressions that you might be familiar with. Linear, you're actively adding the weight, those five pound jumps, you live and die for them. A million little sessions, just doing five pounds at a time, all the way up until that brick wall, it's waiting for you, you run into it, you crash and burn, and you gotta learn the hard way what it's like to try to push through when your recovery just isn't quite up to snuff, when you've overreached. Then you might go down into something like a wave progression, which is linear progression with extra steps. Something like five, three, one, you wave over three weeks between different rep uh, percentage ranges, and then you add your weight. So things tick up just bit by bit over time. Periodization is putting your training into periods. So the important thing, it's not necessarily what happens week to week. It doesn't have to be active in the sense that you're actively driving progress linearly. Some of them very often aren't. The hallmark of periodization is that you're breaking your training off into different phases that are distinct and you're exposing yourself to these different stimuli. And then if you stack them correctly, they can build off of each other and it's great. But there's always the question of how you progress within a block in a like a block periodization scheme. It's not obvious how hard you should be working at what rate you should be increasing. Now, many of them do use a very almost linear active type of progression. So let's say you're doing triples. Over this block, you might wanna see those triples go up. So you start a little light, you get heavier. Over three, four, five weeks, that's enough time to adapt. Then boom, you're done with the triples block and you go into the next block where maybe you start a little bit lighter and you do the exact same thing. Step loading, I had some questions about this on the dynamic double progression because they appeared similar. The difference with the double progression and step loading is a double progression, you're trying to hit those rep counts. So you're going as hard as you can to get close to those those upper range sets, whether it's sets of eight to 10 you're working with, you want all of those sets at 10 reps. So you're gonna go as hard as you can, even as you fatigue. Where step loading, it's deliberate. You're gonna start back and you're adding reps at a pace that you can sustain. So that's a subtle difference. These are all examples of active progressions. They all work very well. You can apply them in a bunch of different ways. I know most of you are gonna see this in your first I don't know what it is. The first thing you think of is how can I take all of these things I just learned and cram them together into one thing? Don't do that. If you want to follow any one of those, that's fine. There's plenty of examples, but like find it and make it work. I like giving you guys all this information because it's really helpful for you long-term to figure out how and why this stuff works, but you have to start small. Start with small projects. Start with a manageable amount of variables. Don't see all this stuff on the whiteboard and think this is all how you get big and strong. So you have to cram it all together. I, I got to get a compilation together of the comparisons I'll do, the videos I'll do. And it's always questions like, okay, so what if I, for my main lift, I do five, three, one, and then I do the boring, but big, but then on my accessory, I do that for the first set last. 
but then I want to incorporate your volumizing. But then there was also this thing I saw from GZCL that looked really neat. And I think I'm going to do that every other week. The mishmashing, of pro that's not what writing programs is. Writing programs start with a template that works, make small changes based on need, stop trying to make the Frankenstein monster. I'm doing this so it's easier, not so it's harder. So that rant gets us into passive or as I call them, static progressions. That means that everything is essentially staying flat. Static means unchanging. That's what we're talking about. So are these deliberately changed, the program mandates change week to week, these stay back. And usually you're gonna see a type of auto-regulation. That's what keeps it back. So RPE is probably the best example that most are go going to be familiar with. It's auto-regulated so that you have to hit the same RPE. So you might do set to three, you might do triples on the same movement. And you might do it week in, week out. And you might do it for as long as you can, only going up in weight if you have gotten stronger so that an RP8 represents more weight on the bar. If not, if you have a bad day, weight might stay the same, might go down. There's some really good bits that Mike Tushier has uh, about his emergent strategies. And it's really just repurposing what Bondarchuk did, who is, he was a track and field coach, and he basically just had everybody do the exact same workout every day. So if a dose of stress works the first time, it can work the second time. So there's some neat things you can do with it. You can find out what your or your athlete's time to peak is, because if you're doing the same amount of work every week, you have controlled for all of your training variables. So if you find that you get stronger over four weeks, but then week five, you backslide, that tells you where the, the under recovery is overtaking whatever benefit you're getting from the training. And that's how you're gonna structure your blocks, or that's how you're going to time your peaks for a meet. So it's really useful to know that. This allows you to control for more things because there's less noise and it seems to work. So that's pretty cool, right? It's also easy to write, makes it easy to auto-regulate all your volume after that. You're not just doing more volume for the sake of it. You're doing an appropriate amount of volume given your abilities that day. So this works really well. And then when you do get to the end of a block, you can progress the reps forward. You can move into a different threshold. So there's always going to be some type of long-term progression, but week to week, we're not changing the program to drive that forward. Or you could switch the exercises, keep it the same. That's also viable. West side is another one that you guys are familiar with. Singles at an RPE 10. That's West side. Now, West side allows you to do that without deloading because you change the exercises. And I think there's a lot of people that don't know that this dynamic is actually what allows West side to work. A lot of people talk about fixing weaknesses. Yeah, they do that, but they do a lot of accessories specifically for that. The variations are specifically so that your nervous system is exposed to a slightly different stress. So if you didn't do this, if you went RP10 for compound lifts, the same movement, you'd get to similarly like up here, you get to three, four weeks in, and then you would backslide. So this is a way really just not to deload. You can do something like this. I typically don't recommend like concurrent type stuff or, or conjugate type stuff for people, but you can do something like this with the same lift where you don't have to engage in all of the changes you just have to make sure you deload every so often and there are some they're hard to find i haven't been able to dig them up but there's some old school powerlifting templates from guys who used to run heavy ass singles with the same movement and it was just based around a deload and that brings us to the static progression and this is exactly what i was talking about we're doing rp 10s we're deloading every fourth week and experiment if you Follow what Mike T says in his emergent training strategies. Keeping everything the same will allow you to find where that week is. You can guess. You can say, I think I know my deadlift well enough. I think I know my bench well enough. I'll go two weeks hard, one week off. You might find you might be able to sustain another week. Some newbies might be able to sustain four or five. It depends. But every so often, you have to intentionally deload. Not because something snapped off, but because you know you have to do that if you want to keep the PRs coming. And every so often you can, again, you can switch the exercise. You can switch to a different rep range. Uh, this type of stuff, I like one to three reps. I think once you go beyond that, it gets too hard to really land on a, a really good number. You have to kind of guess what your seven rep max. And then you can do your auto-regulated back offsets to get some extra volume with the main lift before jumping to your accessory and your secondary movement. I like this for a handful of reasons. I think it's easy to program. So long as you're not just taking it as an excuse to max out every week, you still have to listen to your body. You still have to understand there might be weeks where it's not an RP10. 
or there might be weeks where an RP10 isn't a PR. You're going to have to play around with the D load. There's some investigation that has to happen. So again, the program's a program. It's up to you to make it work. But in, a, in either a very, very heavy cycle after a robust base building phase, or along with a concurrent split where you're doing everything all together all at once, this is easy to program. It's easy to follow. It takes a lot of the guesswork out. So that tends to be why I like this type of program. I also have started doing something similar to this with some of my more advanced competitive lifters because it's easier to work around, especially when I can trust somebody with the weights that, that they're using and to gauge appropriately in RPE. That's where it's really huge. So there are aspects of this that are definitely positive. And even if you don't use something like this, the fact that you know the difference between increasing weight as a means of gaining strength or training to gain strength and letting that determine when you increase weight. There's certainly some overlap there, but they are not exactly the same thing. So understanding the difference here is gonna be huge. Thanks so much for watching guys. Don't forget to check out the Base Strength Forum on Facebook, it's absolutely free. Leave your questions there or leave your questions in the comment box. Till next time, this is Bromley, I'll see you.